Um, next up, we have Wendy Knox Everett, who's actually going to be talking about how to build up a vendor risk uh, review program. So, you know, trying to figure out, you know, again, what's kind of the risk and how do you deal with different vendors and figuring out that out. So, um, please put your hands together and give a warm round of applause for Wendy. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Wendy Knox Everett. Uh, I am a senior security advisor at Leviathan Security Group out in Seattle. Uh, I am actually an attorney, although this is not really a legal talk. I'm going to give you my disclaimer anyway. I am so very much not your attorney. So let's hop in. Uh, what in the world is vendor review? I'm assuming that if you're here, you've probably heard these terms tossed around a lot. Uh, and you have somewhat of an idea of like third party risk is sort of a thing. And you may have just been tasked with creating a vendor review management program at your company and may have gone, oh my good lord, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I, I don't even understand what this would actually involve. So at a really high level, uh, vendor review management programs really are designed to review any of the tools and services uh, that our company is going to use. So when we say third party risk, we're talking about uh, sending our data out, putting stuff onto our website and so forth, there's some inherent security risk uh, that we don't have a lot of control over because it's coming from our partners. And third party risk is still a, oftentimes a pretty big blind spot at some companies. It usually only comes up in the context of a compliance need. Um, and many organizations are unsure of how to deal with it even if they become aware of it. They're also becoming much more popular. Uh, over the last couple of years, they've been moving from kind of a niche thing. Like I started doing these for financial firms, for hedge funds and so forth about four years ago. And if you were regulated, you kind of did it. Um, but otherwise, it was a completely unknown sort of thing. So why is it all of a sudden now something that many more companies are paying attention to? Uh, one of the really big reasons is because of the increase of SaaS tools. So SaaS is software as a service. It's where you basically, instead of hosting a piece of software in your data center, running it locally on your company's computers, you're connecting to a website um, and you have accounts up there and do it. And so really your company's data is no longer just inside your firewall, in your server closet, but you need to trust a lot of other organizations and enterprises in order to do your business. Many tools, um, that we want to use just day to day to do payroll, to do our sales, uh, to do some of our marketing, are not things that we build and not things that we host. Generally, we're also much more aware of security and privacy issues these days. Uh, it becomes something that we see on the news all the time. Uh, there's a, just sort of a lot of trends that are coming together to make this be something that many more security teams are being asked to do some form of a vendor review. So who is this talk for? Uh, I joke and I was saying like when I did my CFP submission, this talk was for me in 2016 when I had to start doing this and I couldn't find anything out there that made sense to me or that wasn't go buy this like $30,000 piece of software and use that. Like I work with small organizations that cannot afford $30,000 pieces of software. Like that's just not a thing that's going to happen. So this is really for the people who have been asked to set these programs up on a small to zero budget. You're probably a smaller company, which is good because you're more agile and we can do more lightweight processes. But at the same time, you still have the same level of third party risk, like your company still has sensitive customer data and so forth. So what does vendor risk review actually involve? Do I need to go buy that really expensive $30,000 piece of GRC software and get a army of compliance staffers? Um, and so GRC, I'm going to say this term a couple times, stands for Governance, Risk, and Compliance. It's the part of software that um, is a little bit more related to working more closely with legal, um, doing audits, and so forth. Or sorry, it's part of security that involves this stuff. Um, so this is really going to be about how to do the DIY approach and breaking this down into a process that understaffed teams can do sort of part-time while they also take on their primary security roles. So I try, tried to structure this talk, so it's going to give you a lot of operational takeaways. I will release my slides after this. I've got URLs and so forth in here, so like, feel free to take pictures, uh, but I will also tweet them out. I have my Twitter handle um, on the end. It's at WendyCK. 
if you want to um, follow me, but I'll also tag them with ShmooCon. So anyway, we're going to talk about how to do this from sort of a tool agnostic approach, uh, using things maybe like text files, uh, spreadsheets, Slack, and I'm going to also talk a lot about how to cooperate with other teams in your company, because especially if you are a small understaffed team, you absolutely cannot do this on your own. So one of the things we really want to keep in mind as we do this is that we're trying to ensure that our company's data and systems stay secure. We might also need to generate compliance artifacts. So do we need to show that we've done vendor reviews for some sort of a HIPAA review? Uh, are we doing a SOC 2 that is requiring us to uh, do some vendor review controls and so forth? And I'm going to talk along the way about the types of compliance artifacts that you would be generating as a side effect of this process. The other thing we want to do is really sort of help get a better grasp of what the third party risk is that our organization is taking on. And so therefore that will help us get a better understanding of the overall risk level that our, our organization is carrying. So the vendor risk reviews are a really big part of understanding and cataloging that. They are not by any means all of the risk that your organization has. But they can be a very significant part of it and it's something that a lot of organizations just kind of go, ah, yeah, uh, we use tools and services and we probably have some third party risk and they don't really dive into it in very much detail. So Jake always uh, manages to tweet something out that's very timely to a Shmoo talk. Last year I did an IR talk and he tweeted something out about logs and this year he just tweeted this the other day, reminding you that your partner risk really is at the end of the day your risk. People are not going to remember that a third party service got hacked, they're going to remember it was your customer data that was exposed. And I want to sidebar this before we get too far in. Vulnerability management and third party libraries used by uh, various developers are very much a big thing. You need to pay attention to them, they need to be patched, you should do some sort of assessment over libraries that you're pulling in and linking in. I just don't have the time to dive into that, that is like a whole separate talk. So. I'm aware of it, it's a thing, uh, we're not going to really address it in this talk. Instead, we're going to focus on three different goals. We're going to set up a way to track all the external services, tools, websites, libraries, so forth that we use. We're going to do an initial risk triage. And longer term, we're going to try to better understand and track that risk level that we take on from using third party services and tools. So. How do I set up this vendor review program? Uh, we're going to assume for the purposes of this talk that we've had, say, a marketing employee or someone come up to us and be like, hey, I hear you're doing vendor reviews now and there's this really cool new tool that I want to use. Like, how do you want me to get started? So that would basically be our initial intake. There are six steps that I'm going to go through here. As you're doing this day to day, like they're going to kind of blend together and so forth, but we're going to break them out into six chunks so we can understand what we're doing as we move through this process. The initial on the intake can be, as we said, someone comes up and t to you in the hallway and is like, hey, I've got this really cool new tool I want to use. You may be alerted in a meeting that the company is going to evaluate, say, a couple different um, like analytics frameworks. Uh, finance may come to you and be like, hey, we've been asked to approve some new tool and we understand that you're going to do security sign offs for all of these. So there's sort of varying different ways that we hear about these. Um, so we're going to go through this talk, uh, as I said, as if we have someone coming up and be like, hey, whiz bang, new tool, I want to use it, how do we get started? So part of the discovery process there really is, as I mentioned, like finance might alert you to something coming in. We need to get buy in from all these other groups within the company. If we just say as security team, we're going to assess our third party risk, we're going to do a new vendor review program, and that's it, like we're in a little island doing this by ourselves, it is not going to happen. Uh, you're going to increase the risk that people will say the security team just says no. We're going to miss a lot of things. We're not going to be able to do an effective review in the way that we really need to. So my whole focus through this is to not be a roadblock. I want to partner with other parts of the organization. It's also because we are only one person possibly or a few people, I'm assuming you're a fairly small security team, you just don't have the bandwidth to do this all by yourself and we need to work with other folks in the company. 
We also need, when we're working with them, to understand that they are not security engineers. Like, I get really excited about like a potential vuln that could happen, or like, hey, I could pop the company through this really cool thing. I promise you, your GC, uh, your general counsel, if you have one, does not care about the specifics of the vuln. However, he cares very, 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 very much about a specific type of business risk, or potentially about the types of data that could get leaked out. So we need to think about how we're going, how we're going to frame uh, the information that we present to our partners. So to start the review process, we need to get the employees to give us some information. Really this is going to be who is going to use this tool and what is it for? Uh, what are some of the failure cases that we might think about? Is this something that like a business process is going to grind to a halt? Like if it's our payrolling, our payroll service, uh, that could be a pretty big thing. If it's a way to uh, host a company blog and we get a ton of inbound traffic from it, that could have a pretty significant impact if it fails. So one way that we've seen uh, companies run this intake process is through a web form. I'm gonna give you some sample screenshots from this. I have super redacted this. This is from a company that I work with where I help run the vendor review process. This is just one way to do it, but I wanted to give you some tips of the things you should ask for. So uh, on here, we're asking what does the project do? Are we looking at the payroll uh, service? Are we looking at maybe an A-B testing framework we're gonna plug in? Is this some cool new JavaScript code? Sort of tell us what sort of domain that we're in and how is it getting used. We also ask here for the terms of service and privacy because we have a legal review as part of this vendor review. On the next page, uh, we ask basically when do you want to have this in place? Especially when you're first starting up your vendor review process, people are not used to this roadblock. Sometimes also an emergency need comes out, like we were using a tool and something happened, it folded or something, and we need to all of a sudden uh, swap in something new. So if there's urgency, we need to know so that we can, on our end, make sure that we're staying on top of this and pushing it through with the appropriate sort of rush. We also ask here, what, what is it going to cost? Um, startups care a lot about cost. If you're looking at five tools and one is like $30,000 and one is just $4 a month, we're gonna have a pretty strong bias towards the $4 a month. Maybe it's not quite as secure, but we think that we can uh, it's like a little bit less secure and we think that the cost savings is going to pay off. Like this is a business decision that we need to pay attention to. We also ask what classes of information will it process? We're gonna do a dive into some of that uh, in a few moments. I just wanna point out that this is what it's gonna look like when you have sort of started grouping the types of information that will go out to these vendors. And we talk about single sign-on. Uh, IT usually loves getting us onto single sign-on from security. It's great when I do access control reviews. I have one place to go to and I can see who has access to this tool. Um, I can tell you right now that onboarding and offboarding with external parties is something that gets missed all the time in access control reviews. And so this is one way if we put it into single sign-on, we just go to one web page and we're like, yep, okay, we can see who has access here. So now we have information from the employee about what they wanna do, and we need to go pivot to getting information from that vendor. We have some security and privacy things that we wanna ask them about. A lot of times, by the time someone comes to you to fill in the vendor form, they already have a contact at that company. They've been talking to an enterprise sales team, uh, maybe they met someone at a meetup and they were like, hey, yeah, you should use our tool, like we could help solve your business need. And it is really helpful to leverage that contact when you show up and you're like, hi, I'm security and I have questions. Uh, really what we wanna do is we wanna ask that vendor, how secure are you? Without like directly asking that because all they're gonna do is go like, oh yeah, no, we're totally secure, don't worry about it. So one of the ways that we do this is with a security questionnaire. It's really the primary way that people gather information about the vendors that are under consideration. There are several standard ones in use in our industry. I'm going to very quickly go through a couple of them. Uh, and I just wanna flag that one of the advantages of primarily using a standard questionnaire is that many companies that are SaaS platforms already have this filled out. If they fill out a standard one once for one potential customer, they can just send it out every time someone asks for it. And so we will usually say, Here's some questions, by the way, if you have a standard one, just send that to us and we'll follow up if we need more clarification. So 
So one of the really big ones is called the CAKE. It is the Cloud Security Alliance's Consensus Assessment Initiative Questionnaire. It has some policy, some governments, some infrastructure information. They map it to NIST and ISO and other controls. So if the company is using a control framework internally, it's very obvious to them what sort of answers they should provide. Uh, for a lot of companies, if you are not subscribing to their enterprise level um, of their SaaS, this is about as good as you're going to get. They'll be like, yeah, we have a cake and we'll send it to you. There's also the Google VSAC. Uh, it is hosted on GitHub. It's basically like essay questions um, that you're going to fill in. I have a, do I have a picture? Oh, no, sorry. I had a picture and I lost it. Um, of, it would basically ask about, you know, like, what are your cross-site scripting controls? Um, and you check off various things and it says like, okay, write us an essay about your security controls. Uh, if you're on the end of like the people filling them out, it can be a little bit terrifying to see that. The other vendor security <laughs> alliance questionnaire, also called a VSAC because like, why not? Uh, is super similar, has a lot of the same types of questions. Um, this one uh, gets also like the company that runs it does a lot of marketing based on your information. It's kind of sketchy. I once uh, let my browser autofill fill in my Google Voice phone number uh, from it and got a gazillion phone calls from them before I realized I should just block them because they wanted to call and talk about vendor security with me. And while I love talking about vendor security with practitioners, not a fan of doing it with marketing companies. Uh, and my first experience with doing this was using the SIG Lite. The SIG and the SIG Lite are uh, put out by uh, shared assessments. They're used heavily within the finance uh, organization. It's the standardized information gathering. Uh, they are fairly fuddy-duddy. <laughs> like when I fill one of these out for people that really are just software and AWS platforms, it's a little bit like, wow, okay, how am I translating this to 90s terms? The other thing I want to mention, and this is not a questionnaire, uh, is a SOC 2 type 1 and type 2 report. If you've ever taken the SysP exam, you have to memorize this. Um, and a lot of the reason for doing vendor reviews is because you need uh, to do it for getting a SOC report. It basically is going to assess you on a couple trust factors. Uh, security and availability and integrity are the three most common ones. Um, type one looks at like, hey, all the security controls within a company look to pretty much be okay, but that's as far as it goes. And then you can do a type two, which is over a period. Uh, traditionally over six months or a year. And if someone sends me a SOC 2 type 2 report, I'm going to look through and page through and be like, okay, how often do they do access control reviews? Is it annual? Is it monthly? Um, and all the other things. And if you get a SOC 2 type 2, it means that they ask for evidence that every single control operated. If you can't get evidence, you get a little exception, which is basically a footnote in the bottom being like, this control did not operate. And sometimes I will look for footnotes and then contact the company and be like, hey, I'm going to send you our very, uh, you know, our uh, secret sauce here, and I want to know, <laughs> like, why you're not actually doing your access control reviews because you had an exception and you didn't actually do them for four months, and I'm concerned about who's going to have access to my uh, very sensitive data I'm going to send to you. So you do not have to use one of the standard things. You can create your own questionnaire, ask about exactly what you care about, just note that at a lot of companies, these are filled in by non-technical salespeople. Depending how you frame the question or whether they can map it back to something they understand and have filled in before, you may get word salad back. Uh, I sometimes ask, like, do you encrypt the, uh, the data that we send to you? And I get back, like, TLS, we use TLS. And I'm like, cool, uh, not quite what I was asking. <laughs> uh, in which we might go back and forth a couple times. So it's something to keep in mind if you build one of these. This is an example of one built by an attorney. Um, it was circulated on a in-house counsel email list that I'm on, and it's really focused on the internal audit controls of the vendor. Like I was reading this, I was like, oh yeah, an attorney totally built this questionnaire. I have a different set of questions I ask. So despite being an attorney, I think of myself primarily as a developer. Uh, so if you're a place that builds software, I have questions for you. Uh, these are some of the things that I'll ask. I have these all ready to go because a lot of times we reach out to a company and they say, you're not on our enterprise sales uh, platform, so we're not going to answer the full questions, or oh my god, we've never filled out one of these, we can only answer a few questions for you, and I'm like, cool, here's my top set of questions. So this is what I'm going to ask if you build software. This is what I'm going to ask 
um, if I'm sending you some form of sensitive data, like are you doing access control reviews? Do former employees still have access to this data? I'm also gonna ask a lot about monitoring and incident response. If I'm pretty sure that your security is pretty sketchy, and I'm also pretty sure that our business is going to use you anyway, we're gonna accept the risk and go do it, I'm gonna immediately start thinking about like, huh, I'm pretty sure they're gonna get popped. Uh, are they even gonna find out when that happens? How am I gonna find out when that happens? So I'll, I will ask like, hey, do you have IR plans? Do you ever practice them and so forth? And then sending it out, I have a template um, that, you know, like we pop in the name of the company, we CC a few people and it goes out. It takes me approximately 30 seconds to do the send out to a new vendor that we're gonna contact. Um, you wanna be pretty uh, quick on sending these out because a lot of times, you know, like the stuff will come in, especially I mentioned as you're ramping up the program, uh, and it's like, hey, I need to start using this tool tomorrow. So the more organized you can be, the more efficient and easy this whole process is going to go. And uh, just sort of keeping track of where we are with every vendor as we go through is really critical. I do not want to have to go and hunt through my email every time someone says, hey, um, where are we with figuring out uh, what email platform we're going to use? Did we ever approve one of those A-B test vendors? There's a lot of different ways that you can do this, um, but it's something that you could think about as you go and do the process. If you're like, oh, it all runs through email and I'm just gonna rely on my email, okay, maybe you can do Gmail labels and be more organized than I am, but I can't just do this through email. Now, uh, we're gonna wanna analyze all the information that we gathered. So we're gonna assume we got back most of what we needed from the vendor, they filled out our questionnaire, they gave us a SOC 2 type 2. Cool. What are we gonna consider as we look at this? Like if you have never done this before, you might be like, wow, uh, I have to trust this company a lot and I'm not even sure how to think about uh, how to evaluate this sort of thing. Uh, one of the first things we wanna focus on is like, well, what sort of uh, trust do we actually need in them? Uh, what are their touch points into our network? Do they run on our website or so forth? And this is where we're gonna take a step back and think about classifying our data. I showed you that uh, intake form that had like, you know, public, internal, customer data and so forth. If you are a semi mid-sized company, I can almost guarantee you that if you have an in-house legal department, they have a data classification policy. You might not be aware, but you probably have one. You should go chat with legal first before you do this and be like, can you show us our data classification policy? Um, they may have already done all this work for you. So some data that you have is super sensitive. Your employee social security numbers that you need for health insurance or for payroll, uh, you'd be pretty upset if your social security number was leaked. You may have special sauce in your IP and so your source code is super sensitive. You may have a ton of data that you gather that you do modeling and so forth off of. You may hold creative assets for customers. At the same time, some of the data you have is less sensitive. Like if we're evaluating a blog platform, we're like, okay, all this is meant to be public. Like we're gonna have our editorial and our marketing staff writing some things out for us and they're gonna go on a blog and we want this to be out in the public. So like why do I need to evaluate security of that? And it's because they're essentially going to be getting the ability to speak on our behalf. So this is a somewhat recent uh, data breach where again, we're not necessarily talking about the vendor, we're talking about Delta because it was a vendor that ran a chatbot on uh, Delta's website. Also, I read this, uh, the carrier still doesn't know if a hacker misused any of its customers' data. I'm like, wow, you've got great monitoring and detection there. You have no idea whatsoever. That kind of jumps out at me. So, now that we have a data classification thing, we're like, okay, uh, this vendor is going to touch this sensitive data, uh, and we have these other types of data that are less sensitive. Really one of the things I keep coming back to is like what's the worst possible thing that could happen from security or availability perspective so I know how freaked out I should be, how much rigor I need as I do this analysis. But we should have some sort of a formal, I say formal because this is all geared towards small companies or agile and whatever, uh, way to review this material. Um, so for instance, we might want to set up a checklist of like, do you have an IR plan? Do you do access control reviews and so forth? 
So some ideas sort of to guide this, if you want to come up with your own process here, is like what sort of threats to the company data are we concerned about? Do sort of your own internal red teaming exercise and capture some of those things. What are the business processes that are going to depend on this? And what will happen if it goes down? You may not have that visibility, but probably the person who came to you and asked to use the tool has a pretty good idea. One of the tools that we use a lot at the companies I do this with uh, is binary risk assessments. There's a white paper up on uh, that web page that will walk you through it. I'm going to do a short little intro on it. Uh, you could absolutely do a whole talk on this if you're interested. Uh, one of my former coworkers did a talk on this at B-Sides LV about three years ago, um, creating a minimal viable risk program, and it uses binary. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor of binary. It's nice because it is short and fast. Uh, you can go to that website and they have a work card and it gives you all these check boxes and I say, okay, the threat that I'm concerned about is I'm gonna put some JavaScript on my homepage to do some A-B test sort of things and I'm concerned because they don't really seem to either act together that that JavaScript could get hijacked and someone could put a Bitcoin miner on my homepage and that's going to you know, kill my place in Google search, I could get flagged as malware and so forth. So can the attack be completed with common skills? I don't know, how hard do I actually think it's gonna be to get into this company's uh, source code and deployment uh, pipeline? Um, can it be completed without significant resources? Do they need to invest a lot of access um, to reach it? And there's a couple other things here that are really interesting to go through. One of the problems here is that as security people, we can be really creative, and I can actually sit here for the same risk and make this go multiple ways. I can come up with arguments for an attack needing to be performed without meeting preconditions or something, it's like public on the website because hey, I just go to that website and you know, like hack the search box or whatever that's up there. Or you know, maybe it does require some preconditions because you know, they have to already have the code up there that's vulnerable and there has to be something that's like worth exploiting behind it. So what we do usually when we're going to do this is we come up with some sort of guidelines of how we're going to interpret the binary questions. I'm gonna run you through quickly, I realize this is a wall of text, um, so you grab my slides afterwards. We're gonna talk a, sort of about like what these guardrails might look like. These are custom that I did for a company to sort of guide the conversation as we did binary. You probably wanna come up with your own for each one of those 10 questions. So here, can it be completed with common skills? Like, it's not actually that hard to use Metasploit and if there's a plugin that will exploit this, like, sure, that's a common skill. Uh, Cross-site scripting, a lot of times we say like, yeah, that's like a script kitty skill, that's a common skill, but if it's a really complicated cross-site scripting, like it's not gonna be like, you know, Joe script kitty doing a bug bounty is gonna be able to pop this. Then we might say like, okay, no. Also, the significant resources, uh, you can say like, oh my God, there can always be an insider threat, and so it always requires significant resources. This is another way to think about it, like do you have to break into a physical data center are there mitigating controls for this? You can almost always set up some form of a detection control, and that's a compensating control right there. The vulnerability is always present in our asset. Okay, sure, if it's a big data lake, a PII, like it's kinda hard not to if we can't de-identify that. Um, sometimes things are only vulnerable when certain business processes happen. So like if you get data feeds from another company, maybe they could slip something in, but you only get the data feeds once a quarter, and so that's not always a vulnerability that's present. Really what all this is trying to do is guide you towards getting some sort of a handle on what our biggest worries are. Like, is this a payroll tool that gives employees access, uh, the vendor's employees access to my employees' bank account numbers? And okay, if you are, how can we check to make sure that you're gonna protect our stuff? Well, are you doing background checks? Are you doing access control reviews and so forth? And that's a way to sort of lead me down from a fear to something I want to look for. The mitigating controls, like I mentioned, I can almost always figure out some way to do detection. Detection's a huge one. Uh, if we're pretty sure a service is going to pose a very high risk, and we're pretty sure the company is going to accept it because we need to take this on in order to do a really important new initiative, how am I gonna be able to figure out if the worst thing that I expect to happen has happened? Like, is there a way I can do monitoring? Is there some other sort of compensating control that I can put, put in? Like, maybe I can create special accounts to connect to this tool that have very, very, very limited access 
elsewhere in my network. They're fairly single purpose, they're locked down. Um, they can't get interactive sessions and so forth. That's a really good compensating control. And as I'm doing the review, I just jot down in like a notebook, I'm like, oh yeah, I should make sure that if we onboard this, I put this in place. Sometimes, after we've done the review, we realize we don't have enough information to do a final decision. At this point, we would reach back out to the vendor and be like, hey, can you help us answer a handful more questions? Uh, if you're on the receiving end of these, you can get in like these endless loops of asking for them asking you for follow-ups. It's really frustrating, so I try not to do that to other companies. I go like, hey, I am specifically concerned about this, and if you could just answer these three questions, I'd feel much happier about it. So I try to you know, be respectful of their time. Also, because I do this for small companies, and like nobody's gonna give us the time of day if I get into the like 20 back and forths. So who should be involved in our vendor review process as we do this? I mentioned we can't do this alone. Legal is one of the first ones that we turn to. Totally not saying this because I am also an attorney. They a lot of times need to review the contracts like the master service agreements, the NDAs, they may want to do a privacy review, make sure there's a data protection agreement or a DPA in place. Signing NDAs is a huge part of this process. I strongly encourage you to reach out to legal and be like, how do we want to handle this? Almost every single company will not give you a SOC 2 without an NDA in place first. And if you have to go print it out, walk to the legal team, put it in a physical inbox, wait a week for them to get it back to you, by the time it comes back, you're gonna be like, what vendor was this for again? So we have different processes in place. Um, most of them are sort of Slack driven. We're like, cool, I'm gonna upload the NDA. Uh, sometimes they authorize us to sign standard ones. Like, like if it only says X, I can sign on behalf of the company. Regardless of what the process is, like make sure you figure it out before you get in the middle of these and you've got like 30 NDAs that are stacked up. IT is gonna be a big partner here. They know your networks. A lot of times they're gonna be doing the actual onboarding. They may have good thoughts about compensating controls to put in place. Sales and marketing is almost always the biggest driver of new vendors um, that need to go through your review process. And they're also very interested in protecting your company's reputation. So like really, we're all on the same side. So you can try to get ahead of the curve here and go talk to them and be like, hey, I wanna talk to you about a new vendor review process. We wanna make sure that we protect customers' trust and we're increasing sales and we're doing this effectively. Like, let me walk you through what I wanna do. Does this work with you? And finance is gonna need to set up payments for all these cool new services. They also are really, really super helpful in finding new and recurring billing charges, which will almost always lead you to a new vendor that bypassed your process. Um, I mean, this won't catch everything, but this is super helpful. Uh, you go to the finance team, you'd be like, hey, uh, we got a cool new vendor security review process. How do you want me to tell you when something's been approved? How do you want to tell me when you find something that you're pretty sure has not been approved? And then we go, hey, Check this out, we're uh, clamping down on shadow IT here. Engineering and development, even though we're not gonna talk about the third party libraries and vulnerability management and so forth, a lot of times they have tools they wanna use, there may be uh, like source control plugins they wanna use, code review tools and so forth. Those should generally also go through the vendor review process. They have access to your company's source code, which is probably highly confidential. If they wanna onboard an A-B test tool or a performance analysis tool, this almost always involves putting JavaScript on the web page, and we get very concerned about that because, you know, is it secure enough or are we going to end up with a Bitcoin miner on our web page in two months? One of the big reasons why we do this, again, is compliance. And compliance is super driven by documentation. So, especially if you're asked to do this for a SOC 2, write things down. Create actual calendar invites and save the calendar invites. Create Slack channels. Use Jira tickets. I do this at a couple different companies and we do it in a different way at every company, but at each one, we can create a basically paper trail, an electronic paper trail of us considering the risk of every vendor. You also should keep track of the previously assessed and rejected vendors because people will come back to you with it. Like you may get a new person in marketing and they're like, I have always used this tool why are we not using it here? I wanna push it through and I can be like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that thing again unless you can show me something has changed from when I did it nine months ago. Like, that's just not worth my time. Compliance needs also. It can be really cool if you can be like, here's the master spreadsheet 
on the first page, you'll see everything we accepted, and on page two, you'll see everything in process, and on page three, you'll see all the stuff I rejected and my security reason why. Uh, you don't have to track that through Excel. Jira, Slack, text documents, any one of those will totally work. And making sure that you can always communicate your status out to the person who asked to use the tool, legal or finance or the other stakeholders who need to know, like, do I do my part yet? Are we approving this? Should I be signing contracts? And also the accepted vendor. It's not usually my role to reach out to that. It's the initial requester. But sometimes I get questions from my security contact and they're like, hey, uh, are you guys still considering us? Do you need us to provide you any more information? It's helpful for me to be like, yes, you're still under consideration or like bounce it to the requester and be like, hey, you tell these guys we rejected them. Like, is that, I'm not a fan of doing that one. Uh, Automating this is really helpful. This again is highly redacted because this is from something I just did the other day. Uh, one of the companies I do this for has a really cool Slack bot that IT built. Uh, we can invoke it with like basically the bang like vendor security checklist. Um, and it tells us we need triage approval, IT approval, legal approval, security approval, privacy approval, and finance approval. And then when we want to give it our approval, we just tweet at it, you know, like what it is with our checkbox. So like I'll tweet out you know, like, okay, I look through, I document our compensating control security with our little green checkbox emoji, and the Slack bot's like, cool, I got your sign off. And anybody can invoke it at any point in time in the channel, so they don't have to bother me and be like, did you do a sign off on this vendor yet? It's really cool. And then, if we're gonna do an audit, we can just print this out and be like, here, like, what screenshots do you want from this channel where we talked about this? I have another place that has a spreadsheet almost exactly like this. Uh, where we have the master list of all of the onboarded vendors. So the criticality is something that we track and as far as like how important is this for our business. Like if AWS goes down and we are mostly a AWS hosted SaaS uh, thing, that's pretty important. Our janitorial service was a pretty lightweight assessment. It was like, hey, do you have insurance? Are your people, you know, bonded and whatever? Yeah, cool, awesome. That goes down, like maybe our offices get messy and we have to go find another one, but like, you know, it's mostly okay. Assuming you have like clean desks and all that fun stuff. And it helps us keep track of this also so then when we go into SOC audits, we can be like, yes, you know, we do an annual reassessment of all of our high and medium uh, vendors, but no, we don't do an annual reassessment of the low because, you know, they're low risk. Finally, we're gonna touch on a couple things about setting up a service once it's accepted. This is usually not security's job. I just want things that you need to be aware of that need to happen. Uh, we want to think about whether their accounts are an SSO. If they're not, we need to make sure to update our onboarding and offboarding uh, checklists and add them to access control reviews. Do these tools enforce things like password rotation? How do they do account recovery? If the person who has the primary login for this leaves your company, how are you going to keep using that tool? Do we have an enterprise sales rep at that company who's my primary contact? And if there's a data breach we're concerned about, do I go through them or do I go through a separate security contact? And can I find that information when it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm scrambling and I'm exhausted? That is something a lot of people do not think about until the first time it goes horribly off the rails. SLAs is usually not your job to track. Um, so availability might actually be owned by someone else in the company. Uh, so you might wanna think like, are there security uh, SLAs that I wanna track here? And if they're really big ones that somehow involve security, like how are these companies going, or the folks within the company come contact me and let me know and uh, get this spun up. And so finally, I talk about iterating over this. Uh, you do this a couple times, I promise you will get the hang of it. Uh, this is a lot to track and a lot to think about, but you'll sort of get in a rhythm, you'll have your partners, you know, I'll know that like legal is going to do what I need them to do and we'll get the NDA signed and we'll get the, the data protection agreement in place. Um, but getting buy-in from the rest of the company can be really critical and this is where iterating on the intake is one of the most important things that you can do. If you create a roadblock, no one's gonna tell you about this and you're only going to find out from about vendors if you're lucky and finance comes and tells you. So the Google form that we use at one company is great. Uh, other places use Slack bots to invoke it. There's various different ways. Think about how you can make it as easy 
as possible for your employees to come to you as soon as they know that they might need a vendor. Can they start a partial one and be like, hey, I'm letting you know that I'm going to start considering these. And then if you immediately say, hi, cool, here are 200 things that I need from you that they don't even have yet, like that is not going to work. So sort of think about what works with your company, what works with your culture. Do you have this kind of thing anywhere else? If you use JIRA tickets, is your marketing company or your marketing team going to be okay with creating JIRA tickets here? Stay super organized. There are a lot of moving parts to a really big vendor security review process. Uh, keep your risk registers updated. If we take on especially risky new vendors, I'm probably going to put that into the overall company risk register in addition to my vendor spreadsheet that I'm tracking. Uh, making sure that I know who is the internal owner of this tool or service and trying to think about how am I going to get alerted when they leave the company and I need to find a new owner. Do I just put the owner as like a department and say like facilities owns this or do I need a specific person? And how is your vendor questionnaire working out for you? Do you do 9,000 uh, loopbacks because you never remember to ask for what you need? Have you learned to ask different questions for web apps versus something, I don't know, like a payroll or so forth? Annual reviews can be pretty key. Uh, these are often done for HIPAA or uh, SOC 2 or other compliance reasons. A lot of times finance likes to help out with these because we find unused tools and services. Maybe this was a uh, basically an analytics tool that we tried out and we used it for a couple months and we decided it's just not that helpful, but we're still paying for it. It's still up on the website. We have this risk and this like money outlay and we're not actually using this anymore. So if you loop back and talk to the owner of a service every time you do this review, that can be helpful. Uh, we would basically want to also contact the bigger ones like AWS and so forth and be like, hey, we're doing our annual review. Uh, can we get our SOC 2? So like AWS makes it super easy. I can just pull a SOC 2 for them back down off of their website every time. Some of them, like our Heroku or whatever, I have to actually reach out to enterprise sales. And then we would track those updated SOC 2s in the folder with our other vendor material. One of the things that I don't have a good answer for, but doing annual reviews can help drive you towards is finding data creep. I onboard a vendor. We're not sending anything particularly sensitive to it. I don't pay any attention to it for a year. It's just silently running. People go, oh, hey, that tool that we already have in place can also do this really cool other thing. And they start doing it without telling you. And now uh, this vendor that was a little sketchy, but we accepted the risk because we're only sending like not very sensitive data there, has like our customer content, which I do care a lot about. And I'm like, oh, this is a problem. Do I reassess them? How do I ever even find out that we are now sending this other uh, data over to them. Uh, so again, I don't have a great solution to this other than talking to people and hoping that we find out when this happens, but it's something that you should be aware of. And the accounts um, on those third party tools and services, they should go in your access control reviews, offboarding should be able to handle this. I almost always see when I go in and do an assessment, when you offboard, you leave around all these third party uh, accounts still living there. And also, I have heard some hilarious stories of how people recover uh, admin access to a third party when someone leaves the company. It's, they're pretty good. This is all trying to make you think about what process improvements you can do. This is going to be a living process. I don't know how flexible your companies are. Most of the smaller ones I work at, like if we have process improvements, we can just immediately put them in place. And we try to do it to make the usability and the ease of this. Um, as high as possible so that we don't have people completely skirting around our process. Any of the pain points that we encounter, like we want to drive towards fixing those. If I see there's a lot of shadow IT being used in a department, we might go be like, hey, are you aware that there's a vendor review process? Um, and like, why are you not going through it? So congrats. Uh, you can now run a vendor risk program at your company. So I want to say thank you to the uh, women of color in tech for the photos. I swiped them off of Flickr. They're all Creative Commons. They're very cool stock photos. Here's a bunch of links, and I will be tweeting out these slides at that. And I think I left just a moment or two for a question or two, if anybody has any. OK, 
Okay, so the question is, have I looked at ISO 17050? I do not believe I have actually looked at that one. I've looked at a lot of random, like, third-party sort of things. I don't think I've looked at that particular one before. Um, I mean, it sounds maybe analogous to asking for a SOC 2 type 2 report. Uh, so it's something that you would plug into your purchasing process and allows you, it sounds like, to put some definitions in it. What was it again? ISO? 17050. 17050. So? Do you have one? Or I can repeat. <laughs> like the wall of vendors. <laughs> um, sometimes they come in as a, like a CFP process, like, hey, we're going to onboard a new email program, and here are the four we're considering. And I will ask them if they have any priority rating on them. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a back and forth. It's going to vary. If they just go like, hey, we have 30 tools that we need to take on tomorrow, uh, some of that is you know, escalating to your manager or whoever runs, like, do I need to go to the CTO and be like, okay, they won't give me a priority. Do you have a priority? Um, someone at some point needs to back me up and understand I can't do 30 overnight. So it, it really, a lot of that drive, er, comes from driving sort of earlier awareness to them so that they know it takes me about three days to do a vendor review and they don't give me 30 that they need tomorrow. They know like, oh, hey, I have to start telling them I'm going to ask about this. Um, and I tell them sometimes, I'm like, if you're just starting to consider something, you don't mind that I email the vendor. Like, just tell me you're interested. I'll send them the vendor security questionnaire. And then when you're ready to move forward, I'll already have it, and we'll, like, take that 24 hours out of the loop. Do you have any more? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Fine, control. Um, so you take about three days or so ballpark to do one. Are you like getting all the information, like all the documents you can from them and trying to review that, that three-day process? Or are you like taking certain things, like I have a hierarchy of this thing weighs more, and if you do, what is that ranking? So what's the top thing I should look for or second? Or second? Sure. Uh, I very much do not always take three days. I have legit done them in like maybe 20 minutes when it's super low right. risk and it's super pressing. Like if it's just something we want to throw onto the WordPress, I'd be like, hey, it's open source, it's on GitHub, I'm going to go yank that source and read it because I'm a developer. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, fine. Like, go ahead, you have security's blessing. Um, if it's something like the email platform I mentioned, we went through that. Like, yes, I asked for pen test reports, don't always get them. Um, asked for the SOC 2 type 2. Um, do some back and forth with them about, like, what's your IR plan? How are you going to tell us when you lose our customers' data? Um, and so it really, I try to drive it off the sensitivity of the right. data and how critical it is to the business. As, like I mentioned, a lot of times I know that this is something that's going to have very sensitive data. Um, and I am basically told the business is going to use this anyway. We just want to get a handle on what the risk is. And so that very much informs how long I take and like how much pushback I'm going to do on the vendor. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody.